वेलकम टू पार्टी स्ट्री Today we are going to discuss about Mauryan economy. Greek sources like Megasthenes's Indica, Indian literatures like Arthashastra, Rock Edicts of Ashoka, these are the important sources for knowing about the Mauryan economy. The governance of the vast territory with the help of an expanding bureaucracy and a huge standing army involved heavy expenditure. new and permanent sources of income to the imperial exchequer therefore had to be found this seems to have been the guiding principle of the mauryan state in undertaking and regulating numerous economic activities which brought it profit it founded new settlements and sought to rehabilitate the decaying ones by moving people out of the overpopulated regions the shudras for the first time were aided by the state to settle as farmers in these settlements they were either entisted away from other places or were deported from areas where the population density was high in order to bring virgin soil under the plow the shudra settlers were granted fiscal exemptions or concessions by way of the supply of cattle seeds and money in the hope of future repayment in the newly settled areas which formed the crown land or crown village land or sita was granted to retired village officials and priests but it could not be sold mortgaged or inherited even ordinary peasants could not reassign their land to non taxpayers failure on the part of the farmers to cultivate the land might lead to its transfer to someone else restrictions on the population of crown villages were doubtless severe and escape from them was difficult one could not become an ascetic without passing the age of procreation taking to asceticism without providing for one's wife and other dependents was a punishable offense so was converting a woman to asceticism ascetics were not permitted entry into the newly settled crown village members of the lower orders could not form associations or groups according to the greek sources gram kshetra or agricultural lands were situated in the outer area of the villages kautilya states about many types of lands kristha or agricultural lands or kristha or non agricultural lands sthala or high lands kedara or land with crops to be collected arama or land beside the forests mand or land for fruit cultivation rath or land for sugarcane cultivation mulabah or land for cultivation of ginger turmeric etc bon or land for trees which were used to supply woods as fuel bivita or lands to collect foods for cows goats etc pothi or land reserved for transport routes other than these there were land for construction houses and temples kautilya seems to have deliberately fostered the rusticity of villages to augment agricultural output so as to achieve the maximum levels of surplus expropriation the exploitative character of the mauryan state is clearly demonstrated by kautilya's own words in arthashastra 
In the areas recently brought under the plough, a sizable portion may have constituted the king's domain or Sita. In the early Pali literature, assignable to the pre-Mauryan period, there are only a few references to big farms. But the Mauryas seem to have owned numerous such farms which were worked under the supervision of the superintendent of agriculture or Sita Dhakshya with the help of numerous slaves and hired laborers. The state farm, where the superintendent made use of an advanced knowledge of agriculture, was a source of royal income no less than the land cultivated by tax-paying private individuals. Large-scale clearing of land by the state, as well as the cultivation of the crown land under the direct supervision of its officers led to an unprecedented expansion of settled agriculture, especially in the Gangetic Valley. But agricultural progress must have owed a great deal also to the provision of irrigation facilities by the government. According to Megasthenes, there were some officers, namely Tinyagranamoi, to look after the irrigation system. The Orthoshastra states about two types of water sources, Sahodaka, which is natural water storage, and Aharyadaka, which was created artificially to store the water during the rainy season. It also refers to the distribution and measurement of water for irrigation. According to Arthashastra, Udakavaga, a water tax was collected regularly by the state wherever it provided assistance in irrigating fields, though the other sources are not telling about that particular matter. Pushyagupta, one of the governors of Chandragupta, is said to have built a dam across a river near Girnar in Shorashtra. D. R. Vandarkar also excavated an irrigation dam at Vidisha, the area of which is 185 into 7 into 5.5 feet. Ranavi Chakraborty argued that there were also private initiatives to build irrigation systems beside the state's role. According to Indica, the peasants paid revenue to the king and so that the king was actually the owner of all lands. But from some indirect statements in Orthoshastra proves that there was private ownership of land. Atindranath Basu, in his book Social and Rural Economy of Northern India, stated about some kind of lands which was a joint property of a group of people. You and Ghoshal discussed elaborately about the revenue system in two of his famous books titled Contribution to the History of the Hindu Revenue System and the Agrarian System in Ancient India. The government derived income not only from its own economic undertakings but also from a large number of taxes mentioned in the Arthashastra. The land tax or Vaga, the chief item of revenue, seems to have been levied at the rate of one-sixth, though the Greek accounts suggest the rate of one-fourth. In addition to the principal land tax, a water says was also levied. Sharecropping also brought substantial income to the state. The peasants often had to pay the Vindokara which was assessed on groups of villages. The nature of such taxes as Boli and Kara remains uncertain. The latter was probably a part of the produced from fruit and flower gardens. Villagers were required to supply provisions to the royal army or Shenavakta passing through their areas, a practice which anticipated later feudal tyranny. Hiranya, unlike the dues, was not paid in kind but in cash. Customs and ferry charges were other important sources of income for the state exchequer.
Guilds of artisans living in the capital were made to pay taxes. Those in the countryside were presumably granted exemption. It would seem that the state made a deliberate attempt to expropriate as much surplus produce from the people as possible. But even the numerous taxes mentioned by Cordelia seem to have fallen short of the needs of the state, for he recommends several fiscal measures for emergency situations. One of these was the levy of pronaya, literally a gift of affection, but which in practice may have brought misery to the people. The cultivators could be forced to raise two crops. Although himself a Brahmana, Kautilya asks the king to confiscate temple treasures, put up shows of sudden miracles, and set up new images of gods to collect money from the credulous. Patanjali, writing in the 2nd century BCE, mentions the Mauryan practice of establishing cults for the sake of raising money. All these ordinary and emergency taxes collected in both cash and kind and deposited in the royal storehouse formed the economic backbone of the Mauryan Empire. The expansion of village settlements under the aegis of the state was necessarily accompanied by the growth of trade, fostered in its turn by the development of the internal communication system, the clearing of land and the founding of new agrarian settlements in what were previously forest regions facilitated movement from one place to another. There is evidence of considerable improvement in the communications brought about by the Mauryas. Patuliputra was connected with Nepal via Vaishali. The development of communications within the country helped inland trade just as peaceful relation with the Greeks under Vindushar and Ashoka gave a fillip to foreign trade with the West. The use of currency in the form of punch-mark coins had begun in the preceding period. Now its use became a fairly common feature. Punch-mark coins, mostly silver, of the Mauryan period have been discovered in large numbers in different parts of the subcontinent with a heavy concentration in North India, especially in eastern Uttar Pradesh and Bihar which formed the nucleus of the empire, though their profusion and chronology have been questioned without much justification. Money was used not only for trade but also for paying remuneration to officers. The scale of state salaries given in the Arthashastra ranging from 48,000 ponas to 60 ponas a year is thus significant. If credence is given to the Arthashastra, evidence the Mauryas state exercised a rigid control through a number of superintendents overall trade and industry. The superintendent of commerce known as Pannadhakshya in the Arthashastra, whose existence was also indicated by Megasthenes, not only fixed the prices of commodities but also intervened whenever there was a glut of any commodity. The office of the Shangsthadhakshya or superintendent of markets was designed to be a safeguard against fraudulent trade practices. The superintendent of weights and measures, the Potova Dhaksha, was entrusted with the enforcement of standard weights and measures. All state boats were placed under the charge of Navadhaksha, the superintendent of ships, who regulated river traffic and collected ferry charges. The superintendent of tolls, the Shulka Dhaksha, collected from the traders custom dues ranging from one-fifth to one-twenty-fifth of the value. Superintendents were also appointed to look after the weaving industry, 
breweries and state liquor shops. On the one hand, royal officers controlled and regulated private trade and on the other, the Mauryan state itself engaged in trade and commodity production. The Rajapanya state goods were normally to be sold by the state servants but the assistance of private traders was also sought. An important aspect of the Mauryan economy which increased royal power and assisted in the maintenance of the vast empire was the state monopoly of mining and metallurgy. The Arthashastra clearly provides for a superintendent of mines, the Akaradhakshya, whose chief function being to prospect for new mines and reopen old and disused ones. The superintendent of salt or Lavanadhakshya, according to Kautilya, looked after the salt mines. Literary references indicate the mining of several metals, notably copper and gold. It is likely that the copper and gold mines in Dhalvum in Chotanagpur were worked for the first time in the Mauryan period. This may have been also the case with the gold mines in Mysore. Judging from a large number of silver punch-marked coins assignable to the time of the Mauryas, it may be suggested that silver mines were also worked. Frequent mention of various forms of iron in the Arthashastra provides a clear indication of the working of the metal. As in the preceding period, iron technology may have been a major catalytic agent in the expansion of agriculture as can be inferred from the proliferation of settlements in the Mauryan period. The intensive use of iron also provided infrastructure for the large scale of manufacture of punch marked coins and the deluxe pottery called Northern Black Polished Ware or NBPW, the introduction of ring wells and most importantly for the efflorescence of the pre Mauryan towns as well as for the rise of new settlements. This view, however, may not be acceptable to scholars who benefit from an advanced technology only to deliberately ignore its significance. The state enjoyed a monopoly of mines, though a great deal of metal must have been sold to traders, artisans' guilds, goldsmiths and individual manufacturers. The monopoly rights of the state over mineral resources gave it exclusive control over the manufacture of metal weaponry and the supply of tools and implements needed for agriculture and industry. This strengthened the power of the Mauryan government, particularly in view of the almost complete disarming of the rural population. The Cotillian injunctions regarding the appointment of a large number of officers, the state control of industry and trade, the government monopoly of mines and metals, and the realization of various forms of revenue from the people give the unmistakable impression that the Mauryan state was highly centralized. But this assumption has, however, been questioned by several historians in recent years. Admittedly, the prescriptive nature of the Arthashastra and the uncertain chronology of its various sections make it difficult to determine the actual extent of control exercised by the Mauryas. But the relevant portions of this text read along with the Ashokan edicts and the Greek accounts clearly indicate that centralization of power in the hands of the emperor was hallmark of the Mauryan imperial administration. But D. N. Jha argued that this is not to suggest that the Mauryan kings were able to make their authority felt equally effectively throughout the country but the overemphasis on the alleged decentralized nature of the Mauryan administration is perhaps 
rooted in the neo-colonialist ideas which have invaded Indian historiography in recent years. So this is the end of our today's discussion. Subscribe our channel, like our video and comment. Listen to our podcast episodes. Follow our official Facebook page, Twitter handle and Instagram. For any query, feel free to mail us. For details, see the description.